Welcome to this new season of the 360 podcast, an all-round look at student-centered education. I'm Adrian Pumphrey, and in this episode with my co-host Laura Gellin, we chat with Dr. Floyd Cobb and John Cronapple, authors of Belonging Through a Culture of Dignity, the Keys to Successful Equity Implementation. We discuss what it means to build a true culture of belonging, how this can lead to meaningful success and achievement, and how we can reframe our language around equity to move toward a more inclusive environment. Enjoy the episode. Well, uh, Floyd Cobb and John Cronapple, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's really great to have you with us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Um, I wanted to um, start with uh, a little quote from your uh, book, um, Belonging Through a Culture of Dignity, um, which I very much enjoyed reading. Um, you, you mentioned that it's been 65 years since Brown versus Board of Education, uh, the decision, and across the nation, our students' educational experiences are still racially separate and unequal, and that it's been uh, nearly 20 years since increased focus on achievement gaps, but there are still exists a mark disproportionality between student groups with so little progress and so much time, we need to ask if we've been searching for solutions in the wrong places. So um, with that in mind, um, I wanted to um, uh, ask you where, in, in terms of equity, inclusion, achievement, where have we uh, been going wrong thus far? Well, you know, I, th I think, as I, as I think about your question, what comes to my mind is, that the United States public education system is still learning how to be an inclusive system. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that is not always appreciated uh, in the way uh, that it likely should, um, which is if we were to think about the public education in the arc of uh, the history of the United States, what we're, we think about is the fact that, you know, um, uh, desegregated schools and public education is, is still a relatively recent phenomenon when you think about it in the, the broader historical context. And so um, while the Brown decision occurred in 55, it was then followed by all deliberate speed. It was then followed by, you know, busing. Um, and then it was, you know, then followed by kind of all these sort of subtle steps um, for the broader inclusion of different groups of students, whether they be students with disabilities, students who um, um, are uh, not native English speakers. Um, and, you know, the, the conversation just continues to uh, extend. And so, um, you know, when we think about, you know, our policy efforts uh, that that we've taken in order to try to, um, um, one, uh, support um, the experiences for all students and, and, and make sure that everyone feels welcome. Um, um, we're, we're, a lot of times we ask ourselves, well, we, we make these statements in, in a way that assumes that everyone has figured this out. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think we're all collectively learning how to how to do so. And the thing that John and I attempted to argue in this book was um, really thinking about this in a in a much more simple way, uh, as opposed to to trying to to deal with it in a in a really complicated and complex way. It's a very complex issue, though, is it not? Uh, how how did you uh, approach that, uh, trying to make it simple um, when it is such a a, a complex problem to solve? Well, the <clears throat> what we noticed within the past five to 10 years is um, the, basically the complication of the problem that sometimes gets called inequity or, or injustice. Um, and what, what I mean by complication is, is that um, a lot of academic language uh, created by brilliant thinkers in, in academia um, end up being kind of thrown around casually on, on social media or by people who, who care about 
you know, the issues around social inequality. And so you get a lot of, of jargon that uh, is being used sometimes uh, appropriately, sometimes inappropriately. Um, and from for people who have not been a part of those conversations uh, or have not read those academic journals, uh, it can be quite confusing. And in its worst case scenario, it can seem like people are talking down to you uh, and, and telling you to do things like check your bias and, and so on. Uh, but what we, what we dedicated ourselves to about midway through this past decade was trying to strip uh, away all the jargon and really get to the heart of the matter around um, what public education in our democracy uh, truly should value at its core in terms of um, in a public institution that serves the community, that offers uh, equal opportunity, and, and it can be extended beyond public uh, education. We, we focus on that because it is an institution that belongs to the community. Therefore, people in the community should belong in that institution and should feel like they belong in that institution. But really, the, the idea extends beyond uh, public institutions into any organization that cares about um, providing equal opportunity for, for its members. And so in the process of, of kind of stripping away all the jargon, what we wanted to do um, was simplify the effort while retaining and even, even highlighting the complexity uh, of it all. Because even though we can make it simpler in terms of providing guardrails for our implementation efforts, uh, we call those guardrails belonging and dignity conceptually, um, it will still be complex. We're working with uh, organizations that have a lot of moving parts. Uh, we are complex human beings. Our organizations are complex and are made of complex peoples. So uh, the complexity will always, always be there, which is part of the reason why the work is so incredibly difficult, um, is that it is complex. Um, so that, that's really, uh, I, I guess it's probably captured best by the word simplexity, which isn't our word. We didn't coin that, uh, but uh, that seems to capture what we're trying to do. When you write about and, and speak about a culture of dignity and the importance of belonging, um, I know that some of the words that you use in the book are, are welcoming environments and unwelcoming environments. I think there's a lot of well-intentioned teachers and well-intentioned parents and well-intentioned schools um, what does that welcoming environment look like and how might we sometimes be unintentionally making unwelcoming environments? Well, I think uh, it starts with the first word in our book, belonging. Um, and this echoes back to something Floyd was saying. So in the spirit of, of us continuing to learn um, how to grow into the principles that you know we espouse within our democracy, in other words, um, continuing to learn to be inclusive, uh, the concept that we feel has been neglected, overlooked, possibly undervalued, and potentially assumed without really being assessed for a large part um, is the concept of belonging. Uh, the idea there um, is that, or, or our focus is that if we could pay more attention to what it truly means to belong, um, then we can, you know, we can we can increase you know, our ability to create inclusive, now use welcoming environments, which is a, certainly a part of it. Uh, but we think of in, inclusive environments as uh, happening at the intersection of unconditional belonging and high access, meaning that you know, it's, it's not just good enough um, you know, to invite everyone in, right? Uh, because if you think about it, think about it this way, equate the concept of access to an invitation to a party, right? I'm, I'm assuming you, you've been invited to a party at some point in your life. Um, you can think of that invitation as access, right? And so even how we started this interview when you're talking about Brown versus Board of Education, and we're talking about you know, the, the decades here of efforts you know, around the, the broader idea of inclusion, um, a lot of the focus has been on access and still our language in terms of um, closing so-called gaps in education often focuses on access and access is essential, but let's just go back to that analogy of an invitation to a party. Just because you get an invitation to a party does not mean that you're going to have a good time. That doesn't even guarantee that you're going to be comfortable there in the party. I mean, you might show up just to be polite. You might show up and it might be extraordinarily different than what you imagined. And you might immediately start forming your exit plan. 
Uh, but uh, the concept of belonging really is the variable um, that, that tends to influence the degree to which you're actually able to enjoy yourself at the party. And you can extend that analogy just to, to any environment or relationship. Uh, the idea is that um, access is essential, but there's something beyond access. Now, I'm, I'm echoing the words of Professor John Powell from UC Berkeley here. Uh, and, and what lies beyond access is the concept of belonging. I'm wondering, um, I know you talk about this some in your book, but how do you, um, how do you assess those things? How do you assess if, if a student feels, uh, not just a single student, how do you assess that there is a culture of belonging in your organization? I mean, I, <laughs> the, the, the sounds flippant, but I always say the simplest way to do it is ask people. Um, and, you know, I, I think about this a lot in terms of, you know, the way that, you know, how, how in my role as an adjunct faculty member, I'm evaluated based upon basically how my student, what my students think of me and my instruction. It's literally how I'm evaluated. And I, you know, I've been, you know, doing this for the better part of 11 years now. And, um, um, and um, I know good, better, and different, whether or not, you know, I provided the students with a quality experience in the class. And I think about it in the sense that, you know, they're spending a lot of money um, to spend time in a course in order to, to move along. One thing that I think happens sometimes in public accommodations in general, um, and I think this is just an overall criticism, is, you know, when you work in government, and we'll use this in the broadest sense possible in the public accommodations. Um, um, people don't have uh, as much liberty to choose something else in the way that they do when we're talking about anything within sort of a capitalistic market, right? So if I didn't like the Starbucks down the street, I'm gonna go to another Starbucks, all right? If I don't like Tar Target or Walmart or the gas station, I'm gonna find another one that treats me better. Um, trying to find another school, however, is a, is a harder thing to be able to do. And so um, sometimes um, the desire for how people experience it, you know, the community is sometimes taken advantage of. And so the very simple thing to be able to do is, is, is similar to what I said before, is, you know, to be able to, one, um, keep tabs on the degree to which, you know, your students feel like uh, they belong. And, um, you know, if you have data at a, at a, at a, at a larger level, um, from the cultural standpoint, you can get a clear understanding of which groups and which identities of students um, and, and families and parents feel like they belong. And it, it creates a very clear understand, you know, very clear target to say, okay, well, you know, uh, we, are, we know that kids from this neighborhood feel a lower sense of belonging than this particular neighborhood, or we know that groups, stu groups of students who happen to share this particular identity uh, are much lower uh, than, um, you know, this particular group of students. And, 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 you know, beyond that, certainly, you know, the next steps are making sure that you talk to them to get a clear understanding as to why. Um, but then from there, you know, it creates an opportunity to get a clear plan of action for what it is that you you need to be doing you know um, as an organization and I think that that helps particularly in, in in conversations in public education where I know that a lot of us have been in circumstances or situations where we've said okay well my goal for this year is you know to increase achievement on the state exam by x percent right and then you teach those students the year ends before you have the data and then you come back and it's like did I hit the goal did I miss the goal Right. And then you kind of have the same sort of conversation repeat itself sort of over and over and over again. And th that late data doesn't allow for us to be able to make immediate changes in the moment. Um, you know, having a clear understanding of how your kids are experiencing your classroom does. And at times that can be threatening. It can be disheartening because you get a very clear understanding of what people think about you. And sometimes that hurts. But um, if we're true in our intentions of truly trying to be inclusive, I think that we can probably ask ourselves, you know, the moments and times where we're not always perfect and where there are times when we will fall, all fall short and be able to identify ways that we can 
you know, help to improve that as best as we can. Um, and certainly within reason, um, you know, for, for those who are, who are part of our classrooms and, or, and our, our, our educational experiences. On that note, you, um, you've mentioned that uh, belonging has to come before achievement. Uh, and I, I, I want a couple of things with that one. Um, uh, why is that the case? Uh, why does belonging need to come before achievement? And, and secondly, what's, what's the link? How does that, how does one lead to the other? Uh, what we find ourselves, you know, I mean, ourselves, Floyd and myself and our, our team, we find ourselves doing a lot is, is building, um, team's capacity and school's capacity to to really deal with the concept of belonging. And part of it is recognizing it and measuring it, like like you were just talking about, like Floyd was leading us through. And the one thing that I want to emphasize here is, is the importance of understanding the enormity of the concept of belonging. Because when we're talking about belonging or true belonging, as Brene Brown would put it, unconditional belonging, as we describe it in the book. Some people just say real belonging. Um, we're talking about something that is beyond what is commonly thought of when people throw around the term sense of belonging, right? And certainly it's a part of it, but the thing to be cautious of is that people gain a sense of belonging in a number of different ways, right? And in one of the ways that um, people most commonly pursue getting some sense of belonging is by trying to fit in. And uh, the unfortunate part of that is that people often uh, harm themselves in the process of fitting in. It might not be immediately noticeable. Uh, sometimes it might be something that they realize later on or even generations later on of what you know, people did to fit in and, and, and in doing so undermining their own humanity. Um, so just to, to bring this kind of big idea here of uh, what Brene Brown describes as the opposite of belonging is fitting in, right? Because belonging requires nothing of you other than to show up as yourself, no strings attached, and you are worthy. Fitting in implies you change something about yourself in order to feel good, right? So um, in order to take this big conceptual idea down to an operational level where we're talking about seeing it and measuring it and so on, um, what we need to be careful of are the questions that we're asking, right? So for instance, when we were writing the book, we reviewed a number of climate surveys. Um, any climate survey that kind of came across, we paid co close attention to it in terms of what each item was really asking. And so what we noticed uh, was in a lot of climate surveys, a number of those items pertain to safety, which is important, right? It's important. Um, but a number of them, uh, you know, apply to safety, either uh, physical or psychological. And then uh, you usually see one or two questions that are phrased something like, I feel like I belong in my school, right? Or even I have a sense of belonging in my school. So uh, as we kind of argue in chapter eight of our book, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, if we're conducting surveys, that we're, we're conducting them with an understanding of the nuance that, that uh, accompanies trying to assess belonging, because what we wanna do is get beneath the surface. If all we're doing is scratching the surface, we might simply be measuring the degree to which people are harming themselves to fit in, right? So what we wanna do is get below it. Now we have four indicators, uh, the degree to which people feel appreciated, accepted, validated, and treated fairly. And what we try to do is align those indicators with items uh, on inventories to see, is this, is this tool, is this instrument, is this scale getting beneath the surface uh, in terms of you know, measuring the concept of belonging. Now, to, to bridge that to what you're asking about in terms of uh, belonging to achieve, this this really does circle back to, to something we were talking about early in the interview here, which is the concept of belonging, you know, very well may have been undervalued, underappreciated, or overlooked, um, because there's plenty of research that shows that when people feel like they belong, they tend to perform better. And there's actually a direct correlation between the concept of belonging and engagement, right? So people who feel like they belong are more engaged in the workplace, they're more engaged in the classroom, and they're more engaged in relationships, whether those relationships are casual or friendships or committed relationships. You know, when they feel appreciated, validated, accepted, and treated fairly, they're more actively and positively engaged. Now, there's positive correlations between act, uh, positive engagement and achievement or performance, if you if you look at the research on you know the classroom, and so uh, you know to get very specific to one of the things you were just asking about, which is why is that so? 
Um, so there's there, there's an, a number of things we could point to in terms of ask, answering that question, but one that I just want to point to uh, directly is what's going on with our nervous system. So when, when we're worried about whether or not we fit in or what the research refers to as uh, a belonging uncertainty, we're uncertain of whether or not we belong, what we end up doing is thinking about it and worrying about it. And so what, what happens is all of us have this finite amount of energy, right? And so if we're spending some of that energy thinking about and worrying about whether we fit in, do I really belong here? What are other people thinking about me? What are other people really thinking about me? Then we can't dedicate our full energy to whatever the task at hand is. Now, there is also research that backs up this up that when we're in that situation, uh, what we would call in the book, um, an indignant hierarchy where, you know, we want to achieve, right? We want to do well, but we are not receiving messages that we belong. It's actually really, really hard to perform at our best, if not impossible. And uh, the reason is essentially, as Floyd always says, it's ultimately a multitasking problem that, that, that we can't perform at our best when we're trying to do multiple things. And then what happens with our nervous system is when that, that worry manifests as a fear, especially when we are fearful that we our actions are going to reinforce negative perceptions of who we are or of groups that we identify with. What happens is what Claude Steele, uh, Professor Claude Steele, uh, calls the stereotype threat, which ends up being the self-fulfilling prophecy where we end up actually underperforming because we're concerned about our actions actually reinforcing negative perceptions. And uh, just to put it simply, what happens in our nervous system is our brain downshifts. Um, this is sometimes called, uh, Daniel Goleman coined a term in, term in the 90s called the amygdala hijack. And what happens is we are in our reptilian part of our brain, which knows only fight or flight. Uh, we are unable to access the modern uh, evolved part of our brain that we need to do well, you know, in school or at work or in a relationship. Um, and therefore, we're in the part of our brain that know, only knows fight or flight. And so it's, it's, it's darn near impossible to perform at our best. So when we're looking at you know, providing environments, inclusive environments that provide equal opportunity. We cannot claim that we're providing equal opportunity when some people in our environment are concerned about their belonging because they have a much harder time, if not an impossible time at performing at their best. So knowing that people might feel that sense of belonging, um, not the sense of belonging, the, the way that we're using the word belonging here, um, knowing that people might feel that belonging from different things, either from different ways of speaking or different ways of how the room is set up or different types of interactions with different individual teachers and, and different classmates and that kind of thing. Um, how, do we, how do we manage that as teachers when you have, you know, some, when you have X many kids in a room, whether it's you know, a, a smaller class of 10 or 12, it feels like it'd be a lot easier to help kind of create that sense of belonging and ensure and maintain and hold sacred that sense of belonging. Um, but for teachers um, who, I mean, there are teachers, I imagine in, in some of your classes where there might, there might be 200 kids in a room at a university level, um, independent school where we're working at, there, there might only be 12 kids in a room. So what do you do when you have these different numbers and you're, you're trying to sort of take care of everyone at the same time? So I think this goes back to where I started in terms of the, the, the things that we have yet to learn how to do. Um, when we think about the process for school desegregation um, and how it was designed, um, um, it placed an inordinate burden on the students who left um, you know, the closed Rosenwald schools basically to integrate into um, the um, then public schools as they existed, right? So the burden was on the student to fit in. And that by and large, that culture by and large has just continued to remain, right? Which is, is, is in some respects, people will have to change enough of themselves 
right, in order to be accepted. And so, you know, John was talking about this as it relates to, you know, what it means to, to really belong. It's, it's, not, it's not having to change who you are, right? And, and so the, you know, and, and I would say, you know, somebody will always give like a random or wild example. I would say, obviously, within reason, within the parameters of the rules of the school, so to speak. But, you know, right now, you know, we, we can sometimes see a lot of stories or even legislation that has been passed um, related to the hair that grows out of people's heads, right? Where, you know, there are requirements being placed upon people to change their hair in order to, you know, quote unquote, fit into the school, right? Like that is a sort of a very clear signal that's indicating that that the way that you are um, is somehow invalid and therefore needs to change. Um, those small things matter in terms of, you know, the executive resource depletion, right, that we wind up having, right, that our brains are like, wow, man, like, well, what else about me isn't right, you know, is the question that we then start to ask ourselves. And so I think the, the very simple thing, um, you know, that I think is a question that we all as human beings struggle with, right, is coming to terms with the fact that we are enough as we are. And the thing that we have to do as educators and as teachers is, is um, while we're maintaining this role of educator, you know, to be able to hopefully provide and supply our students with more information and, and more knowledge, um, than they had when they entered our classrooms is to say that despite that this is a great opportunity for learning and engagement, still you as yourself are in fact enough. And what we have to be able to do is be mindful of the ways that we might either deliberately or even in some cases, in, in most cases, unintentionally, um, you know, send signals um, um, to them that that is the case. Now, you know, a lot of times when we engage in this, somebody will, you um, you know, kind of ask a question about, you know, what happens when there's conflict that exists between, you know, identities. And, you know, John and I will we'll always draw the line at dehumanization, uh, which is to say that there isn't any place for, you know, to suggest that, you know, that my value um, is derived via your dehumanization. And, you know, um, that, that that becomes this sort of false choice that we, you know, um, you know, that, that sometimes gets created. And, and we want to be clear that, um, you know, most things short of that part of the conversation or that dynamic are, are more in terms with, you know, making sure that we're continuing to create places and spaces, um, you know, uh, for, you know, for, for people to, to, you know, exist as themselves. So thinking about how, uh, uh, an educator or a school leader listening to this uh, might be, um, yes, I want to move to a culture of belonging and dignity. Um, uh, and I know you've mentioned in your book, the dysfunctional cycle of equity work that, that many of us find ourselves in sometimes. Um, you've also mentioned paying lip service to research uh, around equity and inclusion. How, what's the first step in breaking that cycle and, and moving forward towards this? The first step, well, I, I think the first step would just be recognition, uh, like a lot of things, is, is, is recognizing, uh, looking within and just noticing that, um, hey, eh, something's going on here and, and asking the question, is what I'm doing actually helping? And, and that's the question that Floyd and I um, started asking, you know, what, what led us to writing this book, because the dysfunctional cycle is not something that Floyd and I are above, right? And when we describe this uh, this vicious cycle or reinforcing loop, it's a snowball effect where the common actions uh, that are taken to address inequity and injustice um, end up um, at its worst being counterproductive and in, in, in leading to more problems or more noise. Uh, but sometimes it's simply, uh, you know, wheel spinning, um, maintaining the status quo. And so I, I think the first step is, is just being reflective and, and thinking, okay, are my actions actually making a difference toward what I want to create? And, uh, 
You know, Floyd and I come to this work with with decades of experience under this banner that sometimes is called diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we have participated in this cycle, and basically to the point where we started describing it, it was it was just reflecting and, and wondering what we've been doing so far. Is it actually helping us get closer to to the goals, or you know, could we actually be doing something better? And we wanted it to be an authentic ask. Right and, and and to to be um, something that that we carefully considered, right? Because the the way we start this book is this metaphor of the streetlight effect. It actually we have a streetlight on the cover of our book, and uh, it's an age old anecdote that that it's 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 a real simple ridiculous story of someone late at night on a sidewalk under a streetlight, crawling around on their hands and knees, looking for their keys. And along comes a police officer who says, hey, what are you doing down there? And the person says, I'm looking for my keys. The officer uh, offers to help, gets down on the hands and knees, starts looking around and, and very quickly notices that there's nothing around. So the officer asks the person, hey, are you sure you lost your keys here? And uh, the person uh, replies, you know, quickly, no, no, I didn't lose my keys here. I lost them down the road. Uh, in the park. And so the officer is really confused and says, well, if you know that you lost your keys in the park, why are you looking here? And the person says, well, this is where the light is. It's it's dark in the park. Of course, I'm going to look here. And, and that's the end of the story. And it's a, it's a, it's a ludicrous sounding uh, uh, story, but it actually reveals something that's very common to all of us, which is our tendency uh, to turn toward buzzwords or trends or fads in order to look for solutions to our problems, right? It's something that's called observation bias. And um, we put it right at the beginning of the book and string it through the book because um, the actions that often compound this the, the dysfunctional cycle of, of equity work, as we call it, um, are often trends. You know, people jump on the latest training and then they think that the problem is going to be solved. But um you know, the work to solving our problems, first of all, requires us to actually identify our problems, not to just jump on trends. And I would say the second thing is knowing the problem, knowing the actual problem you're trying to solve. You know, I, I think a lot of times what happens is, is um, where we get ourselves into this cycle is we wind up trying to solve things that, that are beyond our control. We wind up trying to place success as this sort of global marker of eradicating all bad things or eliminating all bad things and assuming that that's you know achievable within the calendar year right like in 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 the the steps that we take in order to solve that problem gets us into sometimes poor choices a lot of times hurt feelings um and and then it just allows for things to spin and so i think that um one of the things that we observe over and over and over again is is a lot of times people aren't necessarily clear with the actual problem at hand and so then the solution that people take is unrelated um, to the problem and so then you you wind up creating the same sort of spin over and over and over again and i think that um making sure that we get clear about that really matters um, and, and making sure that we get clear about who we want to be as opposed to who we don't want to be also matters. And too many times in this conversation, we find that that's where the, the, the conversation sits. We were not clear with what we're trying to do. We just want to talk about who we're not going to be. And then all of a sudden that leads to a whole host of problems down the line. And it doesn't help us um, in any way, material way, get us to where it is that we want to be. Um, sadly, we're, we're coming towards the end of our conversation, uh, but uh, we have about time for, for one more question. I, I just wanted to consider uh, all the constituents uh, that might be part of this conversation. And um, I'm thinking faculty, but also parents. Uh, I'm talking people that are just associated with the school. And, uh, and you've mentioned that, you know, perhaps the terms equity and inclusion can be politically charged uh, and people come from all over the spectrum. Um, I like the fact that it, it's hard to argue with the words belonging and dignity from wherever you come from. Um, it, it's hard to argue with those terms. 
But for, first of all, have you found much pushback uh, when promoting these ideas and these terms, uh, similarly to equity and inclusion? Um, and how have you um, how have you brought people on board that maybe may not have been previously? This kind of brings you back to the same thing that um, I was talking about earlier, which is that as human beings, we all have the same sort of fundamental desires and the same fundamental needs. And I, I think what, you know, I read something the other day, so this isn't my thought, I don't recall who I read it from, um, but somebody had, 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 had written that, you know, if you ask somebody what the definition of equity is, or 10 people what the definition of equity is, you'll get 10 different answers. And I, and I honestly think that's true, right? What, what, we've, what we attempted to do was to simplify this conversation in terms of it really focusing on things that, desires that we all share. And I think that while we may not all have a common definition of what equity means or is or is accomplished or whatever, um, we do know what it feels like to belong, right? Uh, we, we do know what our own uh, dignity is. Uh, we do know that what our own inherent worth and our value is. And I think that, um, you know, in our conversations, um, with people about this, it has um, it has made it so that more people can see themselves in the solution. And one of the things that John and I were, were, were you know reflecting upon just in our own in our own work, in our own careers, right? And this is like I said, we don't exempt ourselves from you know any of the mild critiques that we, have, have put in our book. But one of the things that we continue to go back to is particularly when you're talking about a public accommodation, right? Um, everyone has to be able to see themselves benefiting from the solution. And um, I think sometimes, and in some cases, you know, um, we haven't been as precise as we probably could have been. And I'm not, I'm not exempting myself from that at all. Uh, and what John and I have been trying to be able to do is just make sure that we're, we're finding ways to, to get to more precision in terms of the way that we, um, talk about our ultimate objective, right. Which is, you know, to, um, move our public schools towards or institutions towards a place where, um, you know, everyone, um, um, you know, feels like, like they belong. And I think it's, it's, it's really as simple as that. You mentioned pushback. Um, so certainly we can certainly probably all agree that that certain language is charged and uh, may not help resolve or even transform conflict. Um, and the language can be helpful. But we have to really recognize why we use language. You know, we use language to to negotiate relationship, and so the pushback um, oftentimes is not merely the language that's being used. It's really the the trust gap that exists between you know a person or a group and and the institution. Um, and so uh, the you know the work is really about bringing people together to create a shared vision of who we want to be as a community. And so when you ask, you know, what have we done or what have we seen done um, that, that to possibly address that, you know, we have some great stories and I'll just put it this way. Um, it, it's pretty simple and it operates like a fractal, which means that it repeats itself at all levels of the organization or the community which is, um, and this is probably a good way to end because Floyd and I see this as a leadership challenge. And it's not only the biggest leadership responsibility, it's the biggest challenge, which is to, to shape communities where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. And so the leadership challenge involves bringing people together to come to consensus around who we want to be. It's the very same process of democracy. And, and you know, while it's easier, or it may seem easier or at least more expedient to simply come in as a leader and tell people what the vision is. 
uh, we feel like uh, the, the harder work that will pay off in the long run is bringing people together uh, to agree upon a vision um, using the guardrails of dignity and belonging. And if we keep, we feel like if we keep those guardrails in place, we may be able to let go of some of the language that we've fallen in love with, but may not be helpful in terms of building consensus. Uh, because the goal is to get to the end goal, <laughs> which is to create communities where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. So that's the challenge. We've we've partnered with some pretty amazing organizations, uh, and and I'll just say there's one in Mesquite, Texas, um, right now, which used to be a sundown town, which meant if you were not white, you had to be out of town by 6 p.m. or by the time the sun set. Now, when you drive into town, you have billboards uh, that articulate what has come to be known as the Mesquite promise, the promise the community has made to itself. Uh, one of the billboards says, you belong. The other one says, your dignity is a given. Uh, a third one says, you were made to excel. And the fourth one says, you are a difference maker. And that's the promise the community has made to itself. And so when, as a leader, you're able to do that, whether it's at that scale or whether it's in the classroom where you bring students together to come to consensus around what are our values, what are our guidelines, what you're actually doing is making accountability possible, right? And once we have come to agreement on who we wanna be, we can hold ourselves accountable to that. And that's the leadership work that we feel is the most important, biggest responsibility as well as the biggest challenge. Well, that seems like uh, a great place to leave things. But uh, Floyd Cobb and John Cronapple, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's really enjoyed talking with you, reading the book. We'll be sure to um, put the link to the book in the in the show notes. And uh, we really appreciate your work and, and everything you're doing in this field. Yes, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. The 360 Teaching and Learning Podcast is produced by Park Tudor School. To listen to previous episodes of the 360 Teaching and Learning Podcast, head to 360podcast.org or subscribe by searching for 360 Teaching and Learning wherever you get your podcasts.